Leading up to the release of the PlayStation 5, I was pretty ravenously following any and all developments related to the new console, including things like game announcements, to the point where I took to Twitch and would often livestream things like state of play events to my duos of adoring fans. Now, sadly I can't seem to find the exact VOD, but it was during one of these live streams that I got my very first look at Ghostwire Tokyo, the game we're going to be completing today. As someone who was, especially at the time, interested in diversifying the types of games I complete, it immediately caught my eye. Of course, by the time it actually released, almost two years later, a lot had changed, but it stayed on my wish list, now on PC, until I eventually ended up grabbing it in a Steam sale not too long ago. Funnily enough, I've also been interested in playing more AAA games, particularly on PC, so it seems like a good fit. I feel like this game hasn't really gotten all that much attention, but hey, with free DLC releasing only a few months ago, now seems like a great opportunity for me to give you my official take on Ghostwire Tokyo. Alright, sound off in the comments section below. Everybody gets three guesses as to where Ghostwire Tokyo could possibly be set. Got your answers locked in? Alright. Ghostwire Tokyo is set in the sprawling metropolis of Gary, Indiana, a city recently enveloped in a mysterious and deadly fog that blurs the line between this world and the world beyond. The entire population of Shibuya has vanished in the wake of the fog, transformed into spirits that you'll... spend a lot of time with later on. Thanks to the weakened barrier between worlds, the entire city has also been overrun by paranormal visitors, malevolent entities that embody negative energy. You play as a young man named Akito, who after narrowly surviving a terrible car accident, finds himself possessed by the spirit of a paranormal investigator named KK. Together, the two decide to team up and take down a masked figure known only as Hanya, save the city, and rescue Akito's sister Mari. You take control of Akito as you explore the vast open world of Tokyo, using your newfound ghost powers to engage in first-person combat with the hordes of otherworldly invaders that have overrun the city. And of course, this game is aptly named because we all know it's the titular city that drew us here in the first place. One of this game's biggest draws is its setting, a version of Tokyo completely devoid of human life. Within the first hour of gameplay, you're given free reign to explore, unlocking new areas of the map by cleansing Tori gates all across Shibuya. Unfortunately, I've never personally been to Tokyo, but I'm inclined to believe those who have when they say that this is an extremely accurate representation of the real world location. Even if it wasn't though, I don't think I would mind, because either way, Shibuya feels alive. Or, at least, like it was once alive. Evidence of human activity is everywhere, from the abandoned vehicles to the streets littered with the piles of clothes spirits literally disappeared right out of. An absolutely huge part of what makes Ghostwire so enjoyable is its undeniably sublime visuals. This is an extremely graphically impressive title, with gorgeously detailed textures, lifelike reflections, and fluid animations all working together to make this world and its inhabitants a treat for the eyes. This was actually the last game I completed on my 3070, and at least on PC, I had no trouble running it at 1440p, basically ultra settings, while pushing more than 120 frames per second almost all the time. The neon lights of downtown Tokyo reflecting off the freshly fallen rain is truly a sight to behold, and the gorgeous scenery is a massive factor in why it's so enjoyable to spend hours roaming the streets and scaling buildings. You'll be doing more than roaming around though, because you are not completely alone. Left in place of the city's inhabitants is a never-ending barrage of visitors you'll need to vanquish. These guys are one of the game's biggest selling points, primarily because they are absolutely awesome looking. Based on Japanese folklore, their designs range from faceless men to paper dolls to horrifying incarnations of pure rage. I love anything horror inspired, and the enemies in this game execute the style really well. Combat in Ghostwire is a thoroughly gorgeous affair, with nearly every action accompanied by a flurry of particle effects and splashes of bright colors. Admittedly though, I can't help but feel that the unabashed spectacle that comes with fights in this game exists over top of an underlying shallowness and the actual combat mechanics. The trailers for this game are full of clips of your character executing these seemingly complex series of moves, sealing shrines, summoning massive fireballs, wiring in spirits, with these choreographed flurries of hand motions. Just watching footage, so much emphasis is placed on the incredible action animations that you can't help but assume that they have some role in the gameplay. In reality though, underneath the flashy exterior, this game plays like a pretty standard first person shooter. Thanks to KK, Akito is able to use ethereal weaving to conjure elemental attacks at will, using the power of wind, water, and fire to vanquish malevolent spirits. Wind weaving is the closest thing you have to a standard ability. It's versatile, has solid range, and can be dosed with a high degree of precision. 
Water Weaving has a wide spread and can damage several opponents with one blast, but it has terrible range, so it requires a little bit of setup to be used correctly. Fire Weaving, on the other hand, is by far the most powerful of the three, but it's also the slowest and the most restrictive in terms of ammo capacity. By holding in the attack button, you can charge up a stronger elemental blast, which is not only more effective, but more ammo efficient as well, so it's usually worth doing. Once a visitor has sustained enough damage, they'll reveal their core, and you can reel them in to finish them off for good. Again, this process looks really fancy, but in reality, all you're actually doing is just holding down the right click button. This is essentially the combat loop, and I find it pretty satisfying. The particle effects, animations, and sound design go a long way to make each encounter feel rewarding, and I don't have any major complaints. But with that being said, you should have all of this pretty much figured out within the first few hours, and with potentially dozens of hours still left in front of you, it's easy to see how things could start to feel repetitive. As you level up, you will get the opportunity to upgrade your character and learn new abilities, but when it comes to ethereal weaving, almost all of the new abilities are just stat boosts. You charge faster or gain wider spread, but the upgrades are pretty incremental and they do little to change the feel of combat fight to fight. Fortunately, you won't spend your entire playthrough fighting. Like many open world games, Ghostwire is rife with side quests that you can complete at your leisure. These side quests seem to be pretty widely regarded as one of the game's strongest elements, and honestly, I'm inclined to agree. Like the visitors, the majority of the missions are heavily rooted in Japanese folklore, taking you through mostly self-contained mini-stories as you predominantly assist wayward souls pass on to the afterlife by reconnecting them with their families or delivering them a couple of rolls of toilet paper. These independent adventures are usually short enough that they don't need a ton of substance to stay interesting. Additionally, a good portion of them take place inside of buildings, which is a nice change of pace. The city of Tokyo is a beautiful map to explore, with a plethora of unique locations that all feel distinct from each other, but with that being said, I always found it to be an absolute treat any time I was given a chance to step out of the rainy streets and into an indoor location. The houses, schools, and subways of Shibuya are some of the game's most well-crafted environments, and the incredible amount of detail put into every object only becomes more clear with every room you enter. Honestly, one of my favorite areas in the entire game is the hospital you visit in Chapter 1. Ghostwire does such an excellent job of using horror elements to construct a compelling environment, while at the same time never coming off like it's trying to be scary. If you're a big fan of the game's side missions, the good news is, for the most part, the story missions follow a very similar format, taking you inside some of the city's most interesting and twisted locations in service of defeating Hanya. Making progress on the story is pretty enjoyable, in large part thanks to the awesome environments you'll be taken through in the process. Unfortunately though, the actual story itself failed to really keep my attention throughout the majority of my playthrough. Frustratingly enough, I think this is partially my fault, although I'm definitely not going to be taking full responsibility. See, by default, Ghostwire Tokyo uses Japanese voice acting with English subtitles, which is perfectly fine for cutscenes but a lot of the game's story is told through character dialogue during gameplay, and frankly, I don't really have the mental bandwidth to read tiny text at the bottom of the screen during combat. What I should have done is simply switch over to the English voice option, but for some reason, the selection is grayed out if you access the menu in-game, so I didn't even realize I could do that until I was close to the final chapter. As a result, I probably didn't get as invested in the plot as I could have, but with that being said, I think the story more than does its job. My favorite part of the experience was definitely watching the relationship between Akito and KK grow stronger as the narrative unwound, until, towards the end, they were able to surprise me with some genuine heartfelt moments. I actually really enjoyed the conclusion of the story, more than I expected to. I won't spoil any specifics of course, but the last two chapters of the game are entirely narratively focused, and they captivated me much more than anything that came before them. I think Ghostwire actually strikes a really good balance in this area, knowing and staying inside its storytelling limitations while still leaving me feeling like I got a more satisfying story experience than most. One area this game has very few limitations in, however, is collectibles. There are a lot of collectibles in Ghostwire Tokyo. In fact, if you're going for 100% completion, a solid majority of the process will likely revolve around wandering the open world in search of a checklist item. Scattered across Shibuya, there are a total of 52 Jizo statues, 28 investigation notes, 48 Magatama, 31 music tracks, 50 outfits, 33 prayer beads, 25 Tanuka, 46 graffiti locations, 17 voice logs, and notably, just over 240,000 spirits you'll need to discover, document, or collect. Now, to be fair, uh, 
That last quantity is a little misleading. 240,000 is a big number, but thankfully it's a mostly symbolic figure representing the population of the real world Shibuya. With the entire city liberated from their bodies, they're kind of just floating around, literally everywhere, waiting for you to absorb them. They're found in these clusters of usually anywhere from 1 to 500, and even then those are frequently found in groups of three or more. Also, you're kind of just unceremoniously rewarded with varying amounts of them for doing different tasks. So yeah, the spirits are by far the most numerous collectible in the game, but the 240,000 number is meaningless. And also like, there are actually more of them in the game than you need for 100%, so there's a little bit of leeway if you miss some. It's, it's not that big a deal. Everything else though, has to be collected one by one, in what is likely to be a very lengthy cleanup session. Granted, some items should come naturally in the course of regular play, like prayer beads which you just get after cleansing shrines, and you might even feel compelled to stay on top of certain collectibles as you go. Jizo statues increase your ammo capacity, and Magatama are important for upgrading your spirit skills. But like, I didn't even know I was supposed to be looking for graffiti, and unless you're making an extremely concerted effort to find everything as you go, you're going to be left with a lot of map icons to fill out. If you think you're up for the challenge though, it's actually a very manageable process. The tracking system is initially a little confusing, but once you get the hang of it, you should start making progress quickly. I tried several different methods of attack before deciding that the most efficient approach is probably to use a website like mapgenie.io and then just hop from pen to pen, sweeping the city for a singular type of item and ignoring everything else. Doing things this way was actually pretty enjoyable. I'm somebody who finds filling out a checklist to be intrinsically rewarding, so I was perfectly happy to just put something on in the background and spend a few hours hopping from district to district, filling out my map, and watching achievements pop up as I go. I'm just happy to spend some more time exploring the absolutely gorgeous world of Ghostwire. If that doesn't sound like something you'd enjoy though, you might have a frustrating time 100% completing this game, because you're in for at least 10 plus hours of this sort of mindless collecting. A lot of these hunts end up sort of tying together in a pretty satisfying way though. It's a little hard to describe, but a lot of times you'll end up completing two achievements at once or finishing multiple quests with a single action, and I just found the entire process to be surprisingly gratifying. It's also pretty likely that once you finish all of the story content, you're still going to have quite a few combat achievements left to unlock. Not because they're particularly difficult, but because, like, <sighs> this game has a lot of mechanics that just don't really have any practical applications. Take talismans, for instance. They're these little pieces of paper you can buy in shops that have magical properties, and you can use them to help you in fights. They can do all sorts of things, some of which are probably pretty useful, and they even have their own keyboard binding, which seems to imply that they were intended to play a relatively substantive role in combat. In practice, though, they're too expensive, kind of confusing, and even playing on hard mode, I never felt like I needed the extra help in fights. So until I got to actively achievement hunting, I literally did not use them a single time. Honestly, it's the exact same story with the bow you carry. It's actually a pretty decent weapon, but your quiver is too small and the arrows are, again, too expensive. So outside of scripted missions, I almost never used it. Also, I'm pretty sure there's supposed to be some big complex food mechanic whereby you can eat different types of food to give you status effects for different situations. There's an achievement for obtaining every type of food, and apparently the snacks are meticulously faithful to actual Japanese cuisine. But again, I just never paid any attention to it. I played through the entire game just eating whatever was up next to my consumable slot, and I never had anything even approaching an issue. When it comes to 100% completing Ghostwire Tokyo, I can't help but feel like there's something microcosmic about these anecdotes. There's a ton of stuff in this game that just doesn't really serve any extrinsic purpose. Like, I feel like this title gets criticized quite a bit for lacking depth, but the depth is there, there's just little in the way of compelling reasons to engage with it. That's not necessarily a bad thing though, because it means the experiences you do choose to have and the time you do choose to spend in this world can end up going a lot deeper than initially anticipated. For those of us after 100% though, while the achievement list is certainly lengthy and the process is maybe a bit eccentric, it's all relatively straightforward, and in my opinion, while the experience might not be for absolutely everybody, it's undeniably competently executed, and a lot of fun for someone like me. Now, normally, at this point in the script, I would only be another paragraph or so away from a brisk 5am bedtime, but we still need to talk about the spider's thread. 
The Spider's Thread is a free DLC update that was released for Ghostwire Tokyo in April of 2023. To some extent, we've already been talking about it. It added new locations, new missions, new enemies, new abilities, new story content, and new achievements to the base game, which were just a part of my playthrough since I started the game after the update was released. What we haven't talked about, though, is the entirely separate game mode bearing the same name, now positioned proudly on the title screen. Set in an alternate reality, this roguelike-inspired gauntlet tasks you with progressing as far as you can through an infinite number of randomly selected floors. I have to admit, when I booted up this game mode for the first time, I was a little overwhelmed. I had just spent nearly 50 hours completing the base game, and it looked like I had another long road ahead of me that I hadn't really intended to sign up for. While this mode only has two associated achievements, they definitely do their job. So if you still want that coveted Steam Ribbon or a Platinum Trophy, not only will you have to fully level up your character, again starting from square zero, but you'll have to complete a total of 89 miscellaneous catalog jobs that basically just amount to long form side quests. To be straight up, this took me about 12 hours, and I actually enjoyed it more than I expected to. Starting over without any of your upgrades is a little demoralizing initially, but pretty soon, in typical Ghostwire Tokyo fashion, they give you a set of prayer beads that lets you one-hit kill any enemy, and it kind of makes the entire skill tree obsolete. From there, it's basically a straightforward grind, and while there are a lot of jobs to complete, you really only need to consciously think about two. Rescuing all 20 lost cats from the thread, and capturing three of every yokai. It's actually a pretty enjoyable mode, taking you through sectioned off areas of Shibuya, combat rooms from side missions, boss encounters from the main story, and a host of brand new locations as you fight visitors, grow stronger, and try to achieve a new high score. I'm honestly really impressed by how well fleshed out the experience is, considering this is a completely free update. There's a lot of new content to explore, and while I was initially skeptical, ultimately I found it to be a really satisfying achievement hunting experience. While I can't guarantee that everyone who enjoyed the base game will be a fan of this mode, I definitely think it's at least worth giving a fair chance. With the spider's thread behind me though, after 66 long hours, I was finally able to claim the coveted Steam Ribbon and move on from Ghostwire Tokyo. I really enjoyed this game. There were certainly some interesting bumps along the road, but it's ultimately an experience I look back on really fondly. I definitely think that you should check it out. Diehard completionists might not fall in love if they aren't big on massive checklists with hundreds of collectibles, and that's completely fine. But if you're a casual player, there's really no argument against it. And if you're like me and consider some achievements and a fully filled out map to be more than adequate reward for 20 hours of gameplay, I think you'll feel right at home. This is an absolutely gorgeous title that I honestly feel like never got nearly the attention it deserves. If you're at all interested, now is a better time than ever to give it a try. While it was initially a PlayStation console exclusive, with a PC version available through Steam, it's since been released on Xbox Series as well, meaning it's readily available for anyone who wants to play. Make no mistake, it was a long journey, but this is definitely a title I'm glad to have on my list of 100% completed games. Alright, I did it! There's a non-zero chance that this will be the longest scripted video that I have ever put out on this channel, and either way, it's definitely the longest I've ever spent 100% completing a game. It was a ton of work, but the stupid thing is, I actually want to do a lot more like it, so if you enjoyed any part of this production, I implore you, please, drop a like on this video and get subscribed so you can see all of my sporadic uploads as soon as they release. Leave a comment down below, tell me what you think about the game, the video, some relevant current event. I really don't care, I'm just here for the engagement and I'd love to hear from you. Also, I don't really post on social media, but if you want to follow me there anyway, I would appreciate it. It's all linked down below along with any of the music that I used in this video. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm trying to get out some Five Nights at Freddy's videos while that franchise is still relevant, and writing this 11 page long script has not been particularly helpful with that process. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.